multicultural world today, bilingual education is more important than ever. It increases communication and productivity and also enhances the quality of life for everyone concerned. Our guests today are Dr. Lourdes Rivera from NSU and Anel Martinez Villanueva, a teacher from Mexico. They will tell us more about the subject following these messages. With us now is Dr. Lourdes Rivera from NSU, Nova Southeastern University, and Daniel Martinez from Mexico. It's a pleasure to have you both with us here today. Nice yeah. to meet you. Thank you for having us. An intellectual opportunity to talk about education. In, in fact, what we'll be talking about is bilingual education, which is a hot topic in our world today. And uh, how do you see the importance of bilingual education rather than imposing upon the entire population here to only focus on English? Well, let me begin by saying that the issue of bilingual education in this country has always been discussed in the political arena. Whereas this is a topic that needs to be in the education, in the economic, in the cultural, in other arenas where the topic is really more relevant. Um, today we live in a global society. We have a global economy. It is uh, myopic, I think, of uh, people in this country to think that the study of a language other than English is uh, detrimental to the education of a child. In my opinion, today all of us across the world need to be speakers of multi more than one language. English definitely is the language, the, the, the lingua franca today is the language of commerce, of industry, of the internet, but that doesn't mean that in order to be proficient speakers of English, we need to abandon, number one, the language that we bring from home, which is a richness that children bring to the schools, or a second language or third language that we want to acquire. All over the world, people speak more than one language. Children in this country don't lack any cognitive deficiencies that would preclude them from learning second or third languages, because people are, across the world do that. So I, I am a strong proponent of uh, English Plus. Well, this country is English Plus. I mean, you'll see street signs, you call a company, and you have messages in English and Spanish and so forth. So I think we kind of have that. But it's, a, it's, it's more an English Plus because of the immigrant population. I don't think that the typical American household family um, understands or values the knowledge of other languages. I think the Im immigrant, constant immigrant population brings those other languages. Uh, and for example, in Miami, it's a myth that it's a totally biliterate or bilingual community. The children that have been born here of immigrant parents no longer speak the language of the home. They forget it. Once they learn English, everything is, the, the entire conversation is in English. And so they lose that richness that they bring from home. If you go to Wyoming, I doubt that many families in Wyoming are stressing or, or valuing the knowledge of a second language for their children. And then when we go to apply for a job, it's, it's important nowadays. The, the most important language in the world is the language of your buyer. If you're going to sell, if you want to, whether you're selling a political idea, whether you're selling an economic idea, whether you're selling a product, the most important language is the language of your, of your client. And so when we have to use translators, um, we lose, we lose. A lot of, a lot of uh, ideas are exchanged in hallways, not around the, the formal table. We go out in the hallway during a coffee break and then a lot of things happen, and then your translator's not there. Negotiations are done, and then we lose when we don't speak that language. Interesting point of view. Anil, now you're from Mexico City, and uh, you teach children in different languages. Tell us a little bit about it. Yes, in fact, I, I am a teacher in a secondary school, and I work for the government. It's a public secondary school. But unfortunately, in Mexico, we don't have programs that uh, sponsor certain areas in education, mainly in public schools. 
So it, I think it's necessary to have them in order to to make a bridge, make make a bridge in between the United States and Mexico. Is public education needs to put a little bit more money and a little bit more uh, resources into professional uh, development for teachers, ensuring that the teachers that are teaching languages are well prepared, that we expect high quality, not only from the professionals that are teaching, but also from the students. It's not, it shouldn't be a remedial program. We cannot continue to think of language instruction in this country as instruction of English for the immigrant child that, that comes across the, the Mexican border. We need to think of language instruction in terms of the global economy, of the benefits for the child, the cognitive benefits, the economic benefits, or the cultural benefits of being able to go to a country and be able to savor the culture of that country because I can understand, I can appreciate the culture of that, of that country. Some people allege that having children study other languages is a liability rather than an asset. What are your views on critics? Let me again say um, that most of these critics are people who have strong sentiments of uh, xenophobia, people who are fearful of uh, uh, people from other countries, a fear of a country being divided. This country is never going to be divided. This is, this is the United States, and the language of the country is English. We shouldn't question that. But languages are uh, polygamous. The more we have, the better. And so these critics are, are focusing on programs that have failed because they were ill-conceived, they were provided uh, the instruction with maybe perhaps paraprofessionals instead of highly qualified teachers. Uh, they think that time spent in a language other than English is wasted time as opposed to seeing it as a richness. And we have evidence today. Um, we have evidence with the new technologies that when we look at the, at the brain, we have evidence that instructing young children in their home language, giving them literacy skills in their home language, is going to improve their acquisition of English. Not only is it going to improve and, and the acquisition of English, it's going to prevent them from having reading difficulties later on in life. And this is not my research. This is the, the, the National Research Council uh, published a, a very interesting book called Preventing Reading Difficulties in Young Children, uh, edited by Catherine Snow from Harvard, and it talks about this uh, evidence that we have today based on brain research. Interesting. I was interviewing the uh, superintendent of schools in San Francisco, and they, uh, int they introduced their program called Footsteps to Brilliance, real nice technology with little iPads where uh, Mexican children were learning simple basic language skills in kindergarten and so forth, footsteps to brilliance. Are you familiar with this? And does, uh, do schools in Mexico implement technology such as iPads, computers, and so forth? Well, unfortunately, in Mexico City, we don't have the resources, I mean, the economical resources uh, to, to support public schools. We need more sponsors. Um, but by... Um, by the way, uh, the government is um, trying to, uh, to provide certain programs, but it's because of the quantity of the schools. So I think we need more support from other countries to, do, to, to, to help the students, to help um, the children, uh, the opportunity to, to develop their skills in English, because sometimes they don't have uh, the English um, as a subject or because they don't have the opportunity to go to an institute of languages. Lourdes, how does technology, in your opinion, affect education in your area of expertise? Oh my God, technology has invaded us in every single area. <laughs> technology today is, is the, um, the thing that is changing everything, medicine, education, all the fields. Um, I, I think that technology is a means to an end. 
it's a tool that needs to be properly used by a professional teacher. I don't think that it can supplant a quality professional in front of a classroom. I think it, it can supplement and help students. Youngsters today um, need to be engaged in their educational process. We can no longer, when you and I went to school, a teacher stood in front of the classroom and we all listened and took notes. Children today don't have that patience. After a couple of minutes, they turn us off because they're used to that constant engagement of a tool in their hands. And so I think that uh, technology can help us to engage the students in the learning process, but it definitely cannot be the sole source of the uh, teaching and learning experience. Some people argue that technology actually is stupefying the public and people are losing skills rather than gaining new ones in many cases. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's better to have a communication in, in a natural way because sometimes we um, have certain phase with technology but not exactly like um, the technology by itself. It's because of the content, the human content with the students, the human content with other people who speaks English too or who speaks Spanish. Um, I think the, the most important thing here is uh, the interchange between people and the communication and that can bring up more um, confidence and interpersonal skills and we can communicate better. Uh, going back to your comment, Richard, when you, um, we go out and we see a family of four in a restaurant and each, you, see, you see them waiting for their meal and everybody, each of the four individuals has a, a, a tool in their hands and nobody's talking to each other. Those are, the, those are the, the uses of technology that are not appropriate. Abuses. You know, we need to be, this, that's an abuse of the technology. There's a time and a place for everything. And, and te technology in many instances has become a, a, an entertainer, a babysitter for children. And adults are the ones that are the first, that, that are answering messages or texting. And so the children are using some sort of a, of a tool as opposed to conversing. And like, like she was saying, having that communication between children with adults, with the people around them. It's really interesting. It reminds me that when I was living in Israel, actually I'm from England originally, I emigrated to Israel uh, as a kid and then I remember that when general television appeared on the scene in Israel, until that moment, people were very informal, very familiar. They'd visit each other without calling to say, hey, John, are you home? I'm coming to visit. They would just visit. It was a very sociable situation. But the moment TV appeared on the scene and you'd visit a home and say, hey, I'm busy right now. I'm just watching Kojak or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the style, the atmosphere, in social activity in Israel changed to the worse because of entertainment. So it seems like if you, if you could just turn the lights off or turn the uh, devices off at some, sometimes, perhaps you could encourage more communication and people might develop more meaningful relationships. Well, we see it when we have storms like Irma or Maria, when we lose power and we don't have the access to all of our technology tools and then all of a sudden you meet your neighbor and you're outside and then people have a barbecue in the neighborhood and you start meeting the people that are around you, that are living around you because you have no access to that entertainment. If that happened uh, in Israel with television and that, that was true across the world, now with, the, with all the tools that we have, that children, you see them, they're, they're, they can't walk yet and they're already using some technology. This is all a very interesting topic. I'd like us to continue, but we have to pause for these commercial messages. I'll be right back. We are back with Dr. Oviro and Anil from Mexico. Actually, you're not from Mexico, you're right here. You're from Cuba originally, I understand. I'm originally from Cuba, yes, but I've lived in Miami 55 years. Tell us about your background, please. I'm originally Cuban. My father was from Spain, my mother from Cuba. I went to a bilingual school as a child in Cuba. 
um, until I was nine, and then I came to the United States, did all of my schooling in English, um, went to the university here in English, and my first j teaching job was in a bilingual school, and that's where I got hooked in the bilingual education movement. Um, I had practically lost all of my Spanish. I could, but I later in life came to call kitchen Spanish, uh, which was social kind of skills, Spanish skills. But when I started teaching in Spanish, the children, the fourth grade youngsters, started correcting my Spanish. Oh, good Lord. So I knew I was in trouble. So I had to go back and reappropriate myself of my home language, and that was a, a, a huge awakening of what had happened to me in my teenage years, and I committed to not letting that happen to other youngsters. So that's, that's what got me into the bilingual uh, field of making, um, making sure that there were opportunities, not only for immigrant children, but for English-only students to learn a second language. Well, I find it inconceivable, hard to believe, but I believe you, of course, that you came from Cuba, spoke fluent uh, Spanish. You could appreciate poetry such as that of Federico Garcia Lorca, and then all of a sudden, because you're so focused in English, you kind of forget. That's interesting. Well, at, when you're nine years old, um, you know, your, your, your academic language skills and your vocabulary is still not where it should be as an adult. And a language is not only uh, learned because you speak the language at home, it has to be studied. Children from, Eng from American families uh, speak English at home, yet they go to school and they all have 12 years of reading and 12 years of English and, and literature and all of that. So I, that was broken for me, that it was stopped, that inst formal instruction of the language ceased in fourth grade and, and never came back. And so I never had the opportunity to study Federico Garcia Lorca because I didn't take literature in Spanish in my high school years. I never had the opportunity to learn a geography or, or content area in English because I, in Spanish, because I didn't study or, or used the language to study. So a lot of it was lost. Interesting. Anel, now you are an expert in your area. Tell us a little bit about what brings you to the United States and you're going to Chicago to interview there with regard to bilingual teaching and the challenges facing that uh, endeavor? Well, I think we are presenting certain challenges. For the first one is the professionalization of teachers in Mexico. Um, on the other hand, we have different programs, but they are restricted and limited by um, professors who are qualified or who have the background and the intercultural skills and that stuff. The point here is that we need sponsors in order to create more intercultural programs, not just for teachers. We have a lot of population in Mexico City and we don't have any opportunities for students or to provide students with the experiences between um, American or other English spoken countries, the schools. And I think it could be a good opportunity to, to make bridges between Mexico and other English spoken schools. Let me tell you, uh, Anel, a, a program that I know of from the uh, Spanish Ministry of Education in, in Spain. What they do is they try to encourage um, recently graduates from American universities, youngsters who are still not ready to commit to a full-time job. So they'll offer them a year in Spain with a salary not huge salary, but enough that they can live, and they work with the English teacher. But the English teacher is somebody from Spain who will always have some, some accent and not as proficient as the American youngster. And so this American student goes and spends a year in Spain. They love it, like they would love to spend a year in Mexico, living in Mexico, and working in a school for a minimal uh, compensation and then they work with the teacher so that they provide the model of the accent, the model of the proficiency conversation. Uh, they interact a lot with the students because they're young. 
Uh, and so students always look up to uh, people that are closer to their age than when they have a teacher as old as I am, for example. But you're young, and we're all young at heart here. We're all young at heart. And also, share with us, with our audience, how you see the challenges facing education in Mexico at this time. After the earthquake that we uh, had, I think it's kind of difficult for our students or, and teachers to, to get um, more opportunities to interchange the um, language with different countries because, as I mentioned before, the, we need the sponsors uh, in order to have public education programs, bilingual uh, programs, in order to have interchanges between Mexican students and foreign students. And I have that, inter that cultural background because it's part of it, it's, it's part because the communication comes very natural in that aspect. Yeah, you want the teacher to be able to understand the culture of the youngsters that they're teaching. And so the being um, bilingual in, in those settings definitely helps. It's challenging in public education because sometimes education is not part of the national agenda. And then every time we have a change in um, government, uh, then the next person that comes will start undoing everything that the previous person did. Whether it was good, bad, or ugly, it's time for me to undo what the last person did so that I can start my own uh, promises and agenda. And so we're constantly changing uh, what we're promising to do in education. And that's, that's you know, Imagine if we did that with medicine. Every eight years, every six years, we started all over again, setting the agenda for what's going to happen in, in medical research. It, it's not possible, and that, when we do that in education. And that, that, that's really detrimental to, to everybody. Speaking of detriment, what's your thought with regard to the importance of bilingualism in our world to, as you said, create bridges but create dialogue between people and the concern that if people cannot communicate, uh, more conflict occurs in the world. How do you see bilingualism as bridging these gaps and enabling harmony, perhaps, hopefully? Well, Richard, language is our, our means of communication. With language, we transmit not only the message that we want to say, but we transmit our emotions, we transmit our attitudes, we transmit our, our fears, we transmit everything. And so if I am going to bridge conflict, I need to be able to communicate. I think knowledge of languages, as opposed to being divisive, can be very inclusive and can be a, a, a tremendous bridge to prevent conflicts, because it would help with understanding of different cultures. Once you understand and you respect and you appreciate, you can celebrate the diversity. It's not enough to say, oh, well, we, I, I, I tolerate or I respect this person. I want to celebrate this person. If I only respect you, you're there and I'm here. I want to be able to celebrate who you are and where you come from and what your culture is and what your roots are. And that can only happen when I am truly not only bilingual but bicultural and I've learned the culture and can appreciate it and celebrate it. So I'm a strong proponent of languages. I wish I knew five or six. My father knew five languages and I, and I, I wish I had that that richness. Impressive, yes, I wish I spoke more than three. I would like to ask you, Anil, uh, to share with our audience a concluding thought before we finish today. I would like to say that, that intercultural programs or bilingual programs need to be a sponsor because we require, not just in Mexico, I think in, in around the world, that uh, quality of human communication between people. And you, Lourdes, please share your thoughts. Well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of my thoughts and my feelings on, on bilingual education with, your, with the audience. 
Um, I would like to my, have my parting thoughts uh, say that um, we need to open our hearts and our attitudes and embrace uh, multiculturalism and embrace diversity, um, embrace the study of more than one language. It is such a richness and it is cognitively good for us. It, there's some research that says that it even deters some conditions such as Alzheimer's and dementia because languages increase your, the gray matter in your brain and that's associated with intelligence. So um, it's good. It's good for all of us. It should be part of our daily diet and it should be part of the definitely of the national educational agenda. Well, speaking of diets, people certainly do enjoy the cuisine from different cultures, so why not the culture as well? A real pleasure having you here. Thank you. At UNL. Thank you.